In this video, I'd like to talk about something slightly different to the usual purely technical videos found on this channel. I'd like to talk about how I went about learning PCB design and how I'd recommend anyone new to this to learn PCB design as well as hardware design. I believe the principles, of course, apply to both. Doing a simple Google search on how to learn PCB design, there are many resources found, how to get started, what to do by various ECAD tool vendors and so forth, but also a lot of forum posts. And that's what led me to making a consolidated videos of my ideas, how I would go about this if I had to learn PCB design or hardware design from scratch by myself. For example, looking through Reddit, there are many different posts talking about how we can learn PCB design, many different posts popping up weekly, if not monthly, on the various subreddits, as well as other forums. So this seems to be a common occurrence, and for me as well, when I started out with PCB design, it was rather overwhelming. Therefore, in this video, I'd like to share my thoughts and how I would go about this, as well as my favorite resources for improving your PCB design skills. Thank you very much to Altum for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altum Design a try for yourself and also support the channel, please go to altum.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's Lab to get yourself an Altum Design a free trial. As we'll talk about, the ECAD tool you use at the end of the day is not important for learning PCB design, but there's good reasons for learning Altum Designer, as we'll discuss in the later parts of this video. Of course, when learning any skill, we might want to consider why do we even want to learn this skill? What benefit might this have? Many of us who are into electronics will have probably started out with breadboard, stripboard, veroboard, or the like, using through-hole components, soldering on all the pieces individually, snipping wires, and so forth. This is a great way to start hardware electronics and get a real interest for it or a feel of how certain components work. Unfortunately, however, there is a limit to this kind of technology, in quotes. We can only use through-hole components, we're limited to certain very specific components, we won't be able to get very high-speed circuits going, and it's quite time-consuming to assemble, which is prone to errors and so forth. The next step up might be choosing modules, for example, from Adafruit or any other vendor like Seed Studio or so on, getting these pre-made SMD modules, hooking them up again with wires, using Arduino, using microcontroller boards, dev kits, and hooking them all together which is a great evolution from going to breadboards, advancing your hardware and electrical engineering skills, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and I certainly did that when I started as well. However, after this, there comes a point where you might be interested in designing your own product. What if you want to put all of these or several of these different modules together with a microcontroller and then sell that? Doing that on a breadboard or soldering these and buying these pieces together is first of all expensive, it's time consuming, prone to errors, and not really possible to make a mass producible product. The natural evolution then is of course to try and combine all these integrated circuits and components on your own PCB. And there's many advantages to doing that, signal integrity, the electromagnetic footprint or signature, manufacturability, producibility, and so forth. That is my predominant reason why I learned PCB design, is to get away from these modules and make integrated modules of my own, custom tailored to what I specifically need. These days as well, assembly and manufacture has become so incredibly cheap compared to five or 10 years ago, or even longer, that it's really easy to get into that, not just the PCB manufacturing side, but also the assembly. For example, a simple two layer PCB will typically cost you $5 for 10 pieces. If you went up to four layers, it costs $50 for 10 pieces, which is incredibly, incredibly cheap if you think about the resources that are needed to produce this printed circuit board. And of course, higher layer count and various other options are also possible. My point being that it's so accessible these days that there's little reason, at least cost-wise, not to at least tempt to go this path. Another reason is, of course, the job market. It turns out that electrical engineers used to do the PCB design work, which means they would design the schematic, the circuitry, test it, and then do their own PCB design and layout. However, the trend that PCB design is becoming separate to electrical engineering, so to speak, is becoming stronger and stronger. Just go to your favorite job search website and type in PCB layout or PCB design engineer. We'll see there are many specifically designated PCB designer jobs, and not with bad salaries either, all over the world. So it's becoming an entirely separate entity, so to speak, to electrical engineering. The reason being that PCB designs are becoming so complex and time consuming and a very specialized skill that it's no longer possible for an electrical engineer to do everything, so to speak. This is of course a great simplification. So this could be another incentive for people to learn PCB design if they want to change careers, advance careers, or simply learn a new skill. 
The problem to me begins even at university. At my university, and certainly from what I've heard from many other people, PCB design isn't taught at all, or only a tiny bit at most universities during an electrical engineering program. If we look, example, at my university, I was there for four years, did my bachelor's and master's there. First year, we have nothing on PCB design. Second year, nothing PCB. Third year, absolutely nothing of PCB. And fourth year, of course, nothing about PCB design. And I believe this is a real problem. PCB design opens up so many new areas, it's so relevant to electrical engineering that at least one module over a four-year course should hopefully be spent introducing the basics of PCB design, at least for people to understand what it is, how a PCB is produced, how we can put components on it, and so forth. Cambridge isn't exactly ranked as one of the worst universities in the world, so it also surprised me that they didn't even have anything on that. However, luckily at the time during my university, in about my second or third year of university, so about 2017, a friend introduced me to KiCad and to PCBs, and I had absolutely no idea what PCBs were, how they were made, what vias were, what traces were, microstrip strip line, and of course I had to learn everything from scratch. So I'm of course very thankful for him to show me this, because my university completely failed to do so, and many universities do. My friend showed me KiCad, and at the time KiCad was powerful, and of course has grown to be even more powerful with KiCad 6 now released. And this is definitely the software to recommend you starting with if you have zero PCB design experience. It's free, it's cross-platform, and there's a huge community. And I have KiCad many things to thank for, and of course I made quite a number of KiCad videos and KiCad tutorials on my channel. I'll leave some links in the description, but I cover KiCad 6 in quite a lot of detail, show how to do some breakout, head for amplifiers, and of course this three hour tutorial which guides you from start to finish if you haven't designed a PCB before. I'm jumping ahead a tiny bit because I would like to show you a few different resources to learn or advance your PCB design skills, but this video, video number 11, is highly recommended if you're completely new to PCB design and want to see the whole process from start to finish. Jumping back to university, you can see on the right, probably about 20 kilograms heavier than I am now. But anyway, the reason I wanted to learn PCB design also specifically was because I, together with a couple friends, founded an unmanned air system society where we built a fixed wing drone. And here you can see one of my first, I'm afraid, rather shoddy PCBs, and we'll see my progression in just a tiny bit. But this was my main incentive to learn PCB design, because of course for a drone you don't really want to connect via wires, loads of different modules together, and have that then falling out of the air. I wanted to combine various inertial measurement units, microcontrollers, power regulators on my own printed circuit boards, and then make a flying drone. So that predominantly was my incentive, rather than, for example, for a job. That came later. If you're interested in seeing my progression, my own path was quite rocky to start with, of course, without having proper guidance, so to speak, so there was no one at university other than my friend who'd only dabbled a tiny bit in PCB design to teach me the ropes, so to speak. So all the information was by trial and error, by looking at other people's design and so on, but we'll go into more detail. So my path was making, for example, first Arduino shields. So Arduino is, of course, very easily programmed. There's a huge community for that. So the first step for me was to make a shield, so it's something I could interface with an Arduino, which has, for some sensors on it, motor drivers and so forth. And that's how I started, simply interfacing with an existing system that I already knew. Pretty soon from that, I tried then incorporating my own microcontroller, in this case it was an STM32, on my own first standalone PCB to speak. So not a shield, not something I combine with an Arduino or any other dev board, but a standalone STM32 microcontroller. And this is something I would strongly want to emphasize in this video, is that to get better at PCB design, or anything in life for that matter, is to apply progressive overload, so to speak. So we want to keep challenging ourselves, trying new things, trying more advanced things, and that is the number one way we can improve. And that's especially true for PCB design. If I continue just making Arduino shields, sure they'll get better, but as such I wouldn't be a better PCB designer. Looking back now at these designs, they're of course comparatively simple to the stuff I make these days. And that's a good way of telling you're also progressing, but more on that later. Continuing that thought process at the time making this video, this is what I'm currently working on. It's a Silent Sync based development board with gigabit ethernet, high speed USB, flyby DDR3 memory, various buck converters, and a 10 layer board in this case. One thing I've always tried to do is challenge myself and do things that are outside of my comfort zone when it comes to PCB design. And I'm not just doing it for the sake of doing something more advanced, I'm doing this because I have an actual need for it. I want to make this platform because it might be useful as an open source tool for other people. I want to make tutorials on sliding sync programming and so forth. I'm jumping around a tiny bit, but another point would be that don't just make projects for the sake of making projects, 
make PCBs and designs for things you actually have a use for and that you want to have produced and that you will have produced. You will test out programs, see what works and see what doesn't. I learned the most from making mistakes and I think most people do. And inevitably due to hardware design and PCB design, because it is rather complex, you will make mistakes and that isn't a necessarily bad thing as long as you don't repeat them, of course. In any case, my number one advice is learn by doing. Try out different PCB designs, try out different packages, BGA technologies, but of course don't jump too far ahead. If you're new, I'd highly recommend just browsing GitHub or the internet for open source hardware projects and seeing what other people have successfully implemented, tested, and start basing your ideas and designs of what other people have done and have proven to be successful. Of course, take this with a slight grain of salt as not everyone knows how to design PCBs properly, or with best practices in mind. Just because a PCB works or is functional doesn't mean it's a good design with regard to signal integrity, EMI performance, and so forth. But to start out, I definitely try and check out other people's open source hardware and so forth. For example, checking out the HackRF, this was designed in KiCad, which is a software to find radio. This is a four layer board with RF sections, FPGAs on it and so on. And this might be a great intermediate or advanced project to look at to see how the routing's been done, how the stack up, placement and so on. But definitely start simple and try to build up, but always try to examine other people's work, see what they've done. But also critically, see what maybe could have done better and what has done well. Of course, this channel is sponsored by PCBWay, so naturally I'm going to be suggesting you try out them to get your PCB manufactured and assembled. But my general point is, don't just design your PCBs, have them built. This is incredibly important to see what works, what doesn't, what is manufacturable, what you can assemble, or what a manufacturer can assemble. With PCB design, it's incredibly important to design for manufacturability, especially if you're doing high volume products, working for a company and so on. A great way of doing that is then talking to your manufacturer, and of course you can just Google PCB manufacturer and choose one you prefer, but it's incredibly important to get your designs produced, to test functionality, to see your work, to see how, what's, how your placement is done, if you can test it properly, how easy it is to interface with, because all of this will help you improve your PCB designs. When we're talking about manufacturability or adhering to best practices and guidelines, with PCB design we have the IPC, which is a standards organization which creates all the standards and references for printed circuit boards. Now IPC standards, as many standards are, you have to pay for them, but it's definitely useful to know these standards and you can maybe get them through your employer. IPC does in fact also offer IPC CID, which is the Certified Internet Designer. So there's the CID, which is the basic course, and the CID+. Plus. I recently did the CID just for the sake of interest because I thought maybe I'd learn a bit more about the standards. And this is my own personal opinion, so again, take this a grain of salt. If you've done PCB design for a bit, this is not particularly useful, this CID. I'm still planning on taking the CID+, plus, but the CID, to me, was a slight waste of time. But then again, I'm saying this because I'd rather you invest in the standards rather than this course, read them through, and understand them. Again, this is my own personal opinion. However, if you haven't got a university degree or similar, it might be useful for your career development to do the CID or CID plus because employers do like to see qualifications of some sort. When it comes to PCB design software, there are many, many alternatives. KiCad, I already suggested, is probably something you should start with because it's free, open source, and it teaches you a lot about the basics of PCB design, and it's fairly easy to use. However, if you're working in industry, you will probably not be using KiCad. You might be using Altium Designer, Mentor Graphics, or something similar. This channel is of course sponsored by Altium, and I do use Altium Designer for my own work and my own spare time, simply because I actually really like the platform. On this channel, I try to only promote things I do use myself and I do believe in. The reason I also use Atom Designer is because it's used heavily in the industry. It's got loads of advanced tools. However, don't let this put you off. You can learn PCB design with absolutely any PCB design software. Also, the videos on this channel teaching you PCB design, the ideas can be implemented in pretty much any ECAD tool. The software really does not matter at the end of the day. I'd like to share some of my favorite resources or some resources that I suggest when you're starting off with PCB design as well as when you're progressing with PCB design. The first place and something that people always recommend is Dave Jones from EV Blog's PCB Tutorial. And this is a simple PDF telling you all about vias, traces, interconnects, and so on, as well as the different layers you have, silk screens, solder mask, and so on. And this is a great primer for people absolutely new to PCB design. Again, I don't just recommend reading this, I recommend reading and then implementing that with your ECAD tool of choice. 
Another great option is, of course, forums and asking other people. Either if you are employed as an electrical engineer or PCB design engineer, you will hopefully have people and mentors around you that you can ask for advice. If you don't, of course, the internet is a great tool, just Googling or going to the printed circuit board Reddit is a great idea. There's many great people here that are very happy to provide advice. However, always take the advice with a grain of salt and do try to think critically and think yourself about why you're doing certain things and don't just take everything at face value. The printed circuit board Reddit is also great because you can submit your PCB designs for review. And this is something I strongly suggest doing. Of course, you can learn many things by yourself and learn from discovering your own mistakes when you, for example, produce the boards, but having other people or a fresh set of eyes look over your PCB and hardware designs is incredibly, incredibly useful. And a great way of doing that if, of course, you're happy with sharing your designs is via the Reddit or other means. On my own channel, I do PCB design reviews about one a month, so people can send in their PCB design reviews. And this is a great way for people to learn, not just the person that sent in the design review, of common mistakes and ways of how we can improve our PCB designs. There's also, of course, paid services for this, where people offer formal design reviews, I happen to be one of those, which then, of course, aren't shared with other people. YouTube and the internet, of course, are great resources for learning PCB design. And one of my favorite channels and people I can recommend when it comes to PCB design, an absolute expert in his field is Robert Ferenek, has great videos on PCB design all the way from simple to very advanced PCB design. And Robert also has Fedevel or Fedevel Academy where he teaches and sells his own courses. Of course, you can learn PCB design without spending any money at all. And this is pretty much how I did it, but I highly recommend his courses as well. On the topic of courses, I of course have my own mixed signal hardware design course offered through Robert Ferenek's Fedevel education platform. But again, I'd recommend starting with YouTube videos first and just learning the ropes on your own before spending any money. One of my most highly recommended videos is this two hour, 20 minute video on how to achieve proper grounding by Rick Hartley. Now I've attended several Rick Hartley webinars and also in-person seminars. If I'm quite honest, this is the person I learned the most from. This is the video that completely changed my perspective on PCB design and gave me so many more tools. So it's well worth this two hour, 20 minutes watch. And I have to admit, I've watched this more than once. In general, Rick Hartley is someone I always suggest you see if you can, if it's webinars or in person or so on. Lastly, because you're already on this channel by watching this video, I'd highly recommend browsing my archive of many different videos, all to do with PCB design, schematic and hardware design as well. And this is also, I believe, a great way of learning and improving your skills. When it comes to books, of course, now I have some recommendations as well. And surprisingly enough, a lot of them overlap with Rick Hartley's reading recommendation. There's a PDF online if you just Google for Rick Hartley reading recommendation or reading list. I'll leave a link in the description below. But a lot of these books I have as well, and I'd highly suggest once you're more advanced into PCB design to check them out. At the beginning, again, don't spend any money learning PCB design. You can get very far by spending absolutely zero dollars. If you do want to buy a book, I'd highly recommend Fast Circuit Boards and Energy Management, High Speed Digital Design, A Handbook of Black Magic, and anything else on this list, but those two to start with. In any case, to summarize, my number one point to learn PCB design or any skill is to learn by doing. Try to improve your skills, try out new areas you're uncomfortable with, and looking back, you'll see that the designs you did one or two years ago are actually comparatively simple to what you're doing these days. Start slow, build up bit by bit, but importantly, challenge yourself. And always review your old designs, have other people look over them, and try to explore various resources. I hope this video was helpful and giving you some pointers of how to learn PCB design and some resources. If it was, please do leave a like and a comment if you have any questions. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more PCB design, hardware, digital signal processing and so on content. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.